my heart. Um, so let me uh, see, I've got a PowerPoint. So let me pull that up. All right. Okay. Can everybody see that? Is that uh, all right? Very good. All right. So, so what has Jewish Catholic dialogue uh, or the Second Vatican Council have to do with the Holocaust? Um, well, uh, quite a bit, as I hope to lay out for uh, you today. Uh, first, what I'd like to do is tell you a bit about my uh, own involvement in Jewish Christian dialogue and how that got started. Um, so as, as Ron mentioned, my, my, my training is mostly in early Christian theology uh, and philosophy. Um, uh, but I've always been interested in interactions between different groups of people uh, in the ancient world. And that sort of carried over uh, into um, my interest in dialogue between Christians and Jews um, today. Um, I didn't become uh, involved in uh, dialogue in any formal way until uh, 2007 uh, when I was contacted by a local reform uh, rabbi who was new to the Rhode Island area. Um, when people ask me, how did you get involved in Jewish Catholic dialogue? I like to say, well, one day a rabbi called me and invited me to the Vatican. Um, and that's exactly what happened. So, so Rabbi Stein um, told me about a conference that was being held at the Vatican uh, under the auspices of the United States bishops and several U.S. Jewish organizations. Uh, and the idea behind the conference uh, was to invite Jews and Catholics from various cities across the U.S. Uh, to meet the high-level figures uh, involved in the official dialogues and to meet other people from the U.S. Uh, who, who had been involved in dialogue and to take these ideas back home and to pursue um, new initiatives. One of the main issues that kept coming up at this conference was the disparity between the progress that was made at, at the leadership levels of both traditions uh, and the lack of knowledge and um, sort of small involvement uh, at the level of local congregations, uh, both Jewish and Catholic. Um, so, so this experience, this conference was very um, inspirational. Um, I had known about Jewish Christian engagement in very general terms before that, um, but at the time I wasn't aware of just how active and organized uh, it was, uh, or even the commitment to it that the leaders uh, in the Vatican had, for instance. Um, so, so Rabbi Stein and I came home from that experience ready to start up some new initiatives, um, and we began a, a series of Jewish Catholic adult education classes uh, for his congregation uh, and my parish. And I was telling Ron earlier, um, I, I continue to do those classes with his successor. So I like to say I've, I've been involved in the classes there longer than the rabbi has, because right? they started with his, uh, his predecessor. Um, but also at Providence College, I helped establish a lecture series uh, called uh, Theological Exchange Between Catholics and Jews, uh, which brings local, national, and international speakers to campus. There's our uh, web address if you'd like to visit our website. Um, so for 11 years now, we've hosted uh, local, oops, local and, in, oh, hold on a second, I went the wrong way. Anyway, sorry about that. I hit the wrong button. Let me try that again. Here we go. This is the right slide. I was showing you the end. I don't want to get to the end just yet. Um, so for 11 years now, we've, we've hosted local and international figures, including Cardinal Timothy Dolan of New York, uh, Rabbi Abraham Skorka, who is a, a friend and dialogue partner of Pope Francis, uh, Professor David Kurtzer at Brown University, who's written extensively on the history of the Vatican and the Jews. And this uh, lecture and colloquium series uh, has also helped us build relationships uh, with the local uh, Jewish uh, community. Uh, and in fact, this is what's spawned the, uh, the dialogue group uh, that Ron mentioned uh, that Rabbi, Rabbi Franklin and I began several years ago. Um, now, none of this would be possible without the publication of a very short document called Nostra Etate, uh, which was published by the Second Vatican Council in 1965. Um, that Latin title uh, means in our age, um, and the official title is a bit longer. Uh, it's, it's called the Declaration on the Relation of the Church to Non-Christian Religions. I'm, I'll just call it Nostra Etate because that's easier. Um, Nostra Aetate was among the shortest of the council's documents. It's only about 1,500 words long, uh, but it was one of the most revolutionary. 
Uh, it attempted to make a caref careful theological balancing act by maintaining the theological centrality of Jesus for the Christian doctrine of salvation, while also charting a path towards sincere dialogue with other religions. Now, nothing really changed in terms of official Catholic dogma. Uh, instead, what was radical was the shifting perspective uh, in the church's approach to non-Christian religions. This was a, a perspective that took commonalities at, as the starting point and adopted a conciliatory rather than a triumphalist tone. Now, Nostra Aetate addresses Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam, uh, but it's paragraph four, the section on Judaism, which is the longest and the most substantive. Uh, and in many ways, paragraph four was the impetus for the document itself. Uh, originally, the council's task was to draft a statement on Jews and Judaism exclusively. Um, now, since its first publication, uh, section four has attracted much public and scholarly attention uh, in subsequent years. Uh, in fact, in 2015, uh, the Pontifical Commission for Religious Relations with the Jews uh, issued a document called The Gifts and the Calling of God are Irrevocable, uh, which is a 10,000 word reflection just on these 1,500 words. So you can see uh, how much uh, thinking and action that it has spawned. Now, the statements made in Nostra Aetate dramatically reoriented Jewish-Christian relations, uh, primarily by issuing a bold call to Catholics to abandon traditional, hostile, inflammatory, uh, and anti-Semitic attitudes towards Jews and Judaism, and to build new positive attitudes and relationships. So Nostra Aetate was not just about words and ideas, but was intended to spur action, engagement, and dialogue. Um, many in the world of Jewish-Christian dialogue have characterized the past uh, 50 or so years as an unprecedented and historic era of Jewish-Christian engagement, at least in the US and parts of Europe. Cardinal Walter Casper, who was the past president of the Vatican's Office for Relations with the Jews, described the current era as the beginning of a new beginning. Now, though, public, uh, no, though No Straitate was published more than 20 years after the Holocaust, the redirection and reorientation it presents must be seen as a post-Holocaust Catholic self-examination that profoundly reshaped not only Catholic Jewish relations, but Catholicism itself and continues to do so. So what I'm calling a hard look in the mirror uh, was prompted uh, by the European experience of Nazism, the shock of the Holocaust, and an increasing engagement between Jewish and Christian intellectuals, both during and after the war. Uh, and this resulted in urgent new directions uh, for understanding Catholic identity, mainly by rediscovering and revaluing Christianity's Jewish roots and developing an openness to Jewish voices and perspectives. So let me talk a little bit first about the origins of Nostra Aetate. And there are some um, fairly uh, excellent recent uh, sources here. Um, John O'Malley's What Happened at the Vatican, uh, John Connolly's From Enemy to Brother, this is the first one on the left. This looks specifically at the individuals and movements that preceded the council. Uh, and led up to the drafting of the document, and I'll be referring to that several times. Um, the, the second uh, volume here is the volume S of essays that were delivered at a conference marking the 50th anniversary of Nostra Aetate. Uh, and most recently, in 2019, Gavin DaCosta uh, published uh, Catholic Doctrines on the Jewish People after Vatican II. So the origins of Nostra Aetate can be traced back to a small scattered group of Catholic theologians and philosophers uh, living in 1930s Nazi-occupied Europe. Uh, among them, uh, John Oesterreicher uh, and Karl Thieme uh, were both converts to Catholicism from Judaism and Protestantism, um, pr uh, respectively. Um, so the stories and impact of these so-called border crosses border crossers, as, as John Connolly uh, describes them in his book, uh, From Enemy uh, to Brother, um, where he argues that Nostra Aetate wouldn't have been possible without the currents put in motion by these Catholic thinkers uh, who were converts and so had both an insider and an outsider view of Catholicism and the church. Now, Oesterreicher was a Jew from Moravia. He converted to Catholicism at the age of 20 uh, and became a priest. 
Uh, in the 1930s, he spoke out courageously uh, against anti-Semitism in print and radio broadcasts and put his own life at risk. Uh, he had to flee Austria um, for Paris uh, and then fled to the US after the Nazi invasion of France in 1940. Um, at Seton Hall, he founded the Institute for Judeo-Christian Studies in 1953, which was the first of its kind. Uh, and he was also instrumental in helping to draft Nostra Aetate at the council. Karl Tima was born into a Protestant family and converted to Catholicism after witnessing the infiltration of Nazism into the German Lutheran church. Um, he joined forces with Österreicher uh, in waging a political and theological fight against Nazi anti-Semitism. His theological writings uh, frequently discuss God's continuing love and care for the Jewish people uh, to such an extent that John Connolly has surmised that he was probably, quote, the first Christian theologian in modern times to state that Christ the Jew loved the Jewish people of the post-biblical era, end quote. These thinkers and others shed new critical, theological, and political light on the history of Jewish-Christian relations and its consequences out of their experiences of the Nazi regime and from their non-Catholic backgrounds. Uh, Österreicher and Tima were loud and vocal opponents of anti-Semitism and recognized that a theological conversion of some kind was necessary within the Catholic Church uh, in particular. Now, they didn't always agree on what shape this would take, but they were in agreement that a, a major change was necessary. Now, the extent of this conversion would not be clear to them until they began to engage with Jewish intellectuals after the war. Uh, Jewish voices would become part of this discussion and provide important correctives. Martin Buber, for, for example, while he recognized the good in this Catholic self-reflection, pointed out that it was happening without any interaction with real Jews or real Judaism. Um, it was kind of theoretical. Uh, in fact, in personal correspondence, he challenged Karl Tima to rethink his theological position that insisted on the ultimate conversion of Jews to Christianity. In fact, this would remain a sticking point even in the immediate post Nostra Aetate era. To what extent could Christians engage in dialogue without turning it into an occasion for proselytism? Uh, in other words, could dialogue and evangelization be distinguished? But it would be the encounter between French Jewish historian Jules Isaac and a pope that would prompt introspection and real significant action at the highest levels of the Catholic Church. Uh, Isaac survived the Holocaust, but his entire family perished. After the war, he published two major works that offered a Jewish perspective on anti-Semitism in the Christian tradition. Jesus in Israel was published in 1948, and The Teaching of Contempt was published in 1962. Uh, Isaac was also instrumental in organizing an international meeting of the newly formed International Council of Christians and Jews at Salisbury, Switzerland in 1947. This group issued 10 points described by John Connolly uh, as the first important fruit of the dialogue between Christians and Jews. Now, I'm not going to read through all 10 of these points, but they include statements like that Jesus was born of a Jewish mother of the seed of David and the people of Israel. Uh, they advised Christians to, quote, avoid distorting or misrepresenting biblical or post-biblical Judaism with the object of extolling Christianity. Um, and also advise Christians against, quote, using the word Jews in the exclusive sense of the enemies of Jesus. These 10 points of Salisburg would have a profound influence on the content and composition of Nostra Aetate. In 1960, as the Catholic Church was preparing for the Second Vatican Council, Isaac requested an audience with Pope John XXIII, uh, which was granted. Now, incidentally, during the war, Pope John himself had helped many Jews escape the Nazi regime while he was a Vatican representative in Greece and Turkey. Now, during the meeting, Isaac presented to the Pope a Jewish perspective on what he called the Christian teaching of contempt. That is the long-standing Christian view that God had abandoned the Jews as punishment for the death of Jesus. This is sometimes called the deicide charge. 
um, and, and the view that the church had replaced Israel as the chosen people, a theological position known as supersessionism. These theological principles, Isaac argued, were not only flawed, but the divine contempt for the Jews they canonized in Christian thought had laid the ground for centuries of anti-Semitism and persecution, setting the stage for the horrors of the Shoah. Isaac suggested that the council consider correcting this teaching. Uh, in his account of the meeting, he reports that the Pope listened very intently. Uh, and when he asked the pontiff if he could have a bit of hope, Pope John replied, quote, you have a right to more than hope, end quote. Shortly thereafter, the Pope appointed Cardinal Augustin Bea to study what was called the Jewish question uh, and to begin drafting a document for consideration at the council. Now the history of the document is quite interesting and much too complicated to get into the detail here, but it has all the makings of a soap opera plot. Uh, there were several controversial drafts. Then Pope John died in the middle of the council and this cast doubt on whether the document would even be considered. There was a papal election to follow that. Then there was opposition from some cardinals on theological grounds, a vocal contingent of Catholic clergy from the Middle East who feared repercussions from the Muslim majority for what might look like um, support for the state of Israel. Uh, and at the 11th hour, the document was almost tabled. Um, a draft had been leaked to the press, which included a statement on the conversion of Jews. This naturally enraged Jewish participants in the process, such as Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who famously stated upon hearing this, quote, if I were asked either to convert or to die in Auschwitz, I'd rather go to Auschwitz, end quote. Ultimately, this statement was removed. Uh, the document, which originated as a statement on the Jews with the working title De Judais on the Jews, was expanded into a broader and more inclusive statement on interreligious relations in general. And this was also not without controversy. Uh, nevertheless, the paragraph on Judaism, section four, remained the longest and the most detailed. And in the end, the document was approved by an overwhelming vote, just 88 no's and over 2,000 votes in the affirmative. So what I'd like to do now is turn to the document itself and identify what I see as five major points. Uh, and, and each of these emerges from the kind of introspection and reevaluation that I just uh, described. So the first point, um, as a document that takes up the question of interreligious uh, relations in general, Nostra Aetate defines the relationship between Judaism and Christianity as one that is unique, unlike the relationship Christianity has with any other religious tradition. So the document begins uh, by identifying what it calls common unsolved riddles of the human condition. Right, you can see that in the, the second section there. Um, so it, it brings up questions uh, of meaning that, that it describes to every religious tradition. What is the meaning of life? What is the moral good? What is death and so on? Um, these quest questions, the document says, Christians share with Hindus, Buddhists, and other religions. Um, beyond this, Nostra Aetate also expresses esteem for Islam. But in introducing the discussion of Judaism in paragraph four, uh, it refers to, quote, uh, the bond that spiritually ties the people of the new covenant to Abraham's stock. You can see that in the first section there. That is, Nostra Aetate acknowledges a unique relationship, a spiritual bond that ties Jews and Christians together. This unique relationship is built upon the shared scriptures of the Hebrew Bible, a shared sense of history and tradition, ideas about God and ethics, and the historical origins of Christianity out of the institutions of ancient Judaism. Now, this wasn't new or a groundbreaking insight. Uh, the documents of the New Testament and the early church writings recognized that Christianity emerged from Judaism. What was different, however, was that instead of framing this relationship in antagonistic or triumphalist terms that has been in the, in the case in the past, Nostra Aetate strikes a more conciliatory tone, almost as a reminder to Christians that Christianity depends on the Hebrew scriptures and that its connection to Judaism is vital for its very identity. Uh, so if you look at the third uh, paragraph here, 
The church, therefore, cannot forget that she received the revelation of the Old Testament through the people with whom God, in his inexpressible mercy, concluded the ancient covenant. It's interesting, it, av it avoids old covenant there, it uses ancient covenant instead. Nor can she forget that she draws sustenance from the root of that well-cultivated olive tree onto which had been grafted the wild shoots, the Gentiles. Okay, so what is this about trees? Well, the, the image of the olive tree that's used here is taken from the New Testament, uh, from St. Paul's letter to the Romans. There, uh, Paul describes an ancient and venerable olive tree onto which are grafted wild shoots, which then grow into an organic relationship with the tree and its trunk. Biblical scholars have offered varying interpretations of this image, but Nostra Aetate invokes it as an image of a Gentile church, that is a non-Jewish church, that exists and depends on, grows with, and becomes one with the root of Israel. Nostra Aetate's use of this image was significant because previously Christian theology focused on images that suggested the church replaced Israel, that view known as supersessionism. So rather than replacement, the image of Gentiles being grafted onto the sustaining roots of Israel highlights a relationship of coexistence and interdependence between Jews and Christians as two peoples in covenant with God. This would lead Pope John Paul II, who in the estimation of most was the most influential Pope after Vatican II in furthering Jewish uh, Christian dialogue to describe the encounter and engagement with the people of Israel as quote, intrinsic to our own religion that is intrinsic to the Christian life uh, and even to understanding the nature of the church itself. Uh, Pope John Paul II set, uh, made this statement during his visit to the Rome synagogue in 1986, which incidentally was the first time that a Pope had set foot in a Jewish house of worship. Now this brings us to the second point. Uh, the engagement with Judaism that Nostra Aetate calls for does not end at reading the Christian Old Testament or romanticizing the religion of Jesus or merely studying ancient Judaism as background. Uh, instead, Nostra Aetate called Catholics to an encounter with living Judaism. That is Judaism as it is practiced and understood by Jews themselves today. Christian writers from the first centuries of the common era had a lot to say about Jews and Judaism. Um, we even know that there were occasional contacts between some of the church fathers and the early rabbis. However, the Christian depiction of Jews throughout history seems to have borne little resemblance to the living Judaism of the time. Instead, what emerged was a construct, what some scholars have referred to as rhetorical Jews, that is caricatures based on certain biblical tropes and other stereotypes, which came to be understood as true characterizations of real Jews. Now, the, wordings, the wording of these uh, uh, church documents is carefully thought through. Every sentence, every word, and every tense of every verb is carefully thought out. So it's significant that Nostra Aetate states uh, that God holds the Jews most dear for the sake of their fathers in the present tense. This flies in the face of previous Christian theology uh, that claimed God had forsaken the Jewish people. So Nostra Aetate states clearly that the Jewish people of the present day still enjoy a unique relationship with God. And this is based in large part on a quote from Paul's letter to the Romans, where Paul states that the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. Now, in his 1986 address at the synagogue in Rome, Pope John Paul II expanded this idea. He said, quote, with Judaism, therefore, we have a relationship which we do not have with any other religion. You are our dearly beloved brothers, and in a certain way, it could be said that you are our elder brothers, end quote. Here, theologians took note of John Paul's use of the present tense. It was not was simply the... that Judaism was or has been central to Christian self-understanding, but that it is, and that Christians still have a meaningful relationship with Jews. The Pope looked at the Jewish community in front of him and said, you are our elder brothers. 
So John Paul's remarks were important because they advanced the ideas put forth in Nostra Aetate in a specific direction. Uh, for Catholics, it would not be enough simply to improve relations with Jews, but to recognize and see Jewishness at the core of Christianness. In fact, this principle is reflected even in the actual institutional structure of the Catholic Church's dialogue with Jews. Uh, the office that oversees it, the Commission for Religious Relations with the Jews, is housed not under the direction of the office that oversees interreligious dialogue, but it's with the office that oversees the dialogue with other Christian denominations. So what does that mean? Uh, it means the Catholic Church sees its dialogue with Jews as sort of in-house, more akin to its dialogue with other Christians than to its dialogue with other religions like Islam and Buddhism. This was one con concrete step by which Christians were to engage and dialogue directly with members of the various traditions of Judaism. Uh, since Jews had been constructed in mostly negative ways to serve as a foil to Christianity, a real honest encounter between Jews and Christians in which Christians would learn to listen to Jewish voices and forge relationships with their Jewish neighbors and peers would contribute to a faithful representation and understanding of Judaism. The Vatican Commission for Religious Relations with the Jews made this explicit in 1974 in a document recommending how to implement the teaching of Nostra Aetate. It said, quote, on the practical level in particular, Christians must therefore strive to acquire a better knowledge of the basic components of the religious tradition of Judaism. They must strive to learn by what essential traits the Jews define themselves in the light of their own religious experience. End quote. This understanding of the other, then, uh, could, could lead to a transformed understanding of the Christian self. Now, Nostra Aetate envisions these encounters taking place not only at the highest levels, but in the academy and in local communities also. So here the, the document says, since the spiritual patrimony common to Christians and Jews is thus so great, this sacred synod wants to foster and recommend that, mu that mutual understanding and respect, which is the fruit above all of biblical and theological studies as well as fraternal dialogue. So that fraternal dialogue is kind of having an eye on the grassroots level. <clears throat> now, moving on to the third point. Now, to assert the enduring value of contemporary Judaism was a reversal from the centuries long disparagement of Judaism, of rabbinic Judaism, as an aberration from biblical Judaism. Uh, the church father, uh, Augustine of Hippo, who died in 430, had stated that Judaism had value for Christians only in as much as Jews served as a witness to Old Testament revelation and a validation of the truth of Christianity. In a famous passage, he described Jews as the book holders of Christianity, whose predicament as a people in diaspora served as a warning to Christians to remain faithful or suffer the same consequence. Now, Augustine's view persisted for centuries, leading to Christians viewing Jews as a kind of living relic of the past, rather than a vibrant, diverse, and developing tradition. So the new approach mapped out by Nostra Aetate, in turn, required a deep theological reevaluation of key claims that defined Jewish-Christian relations for millennia. And these are the ideas of supersessionism and the charge of deicide. Uh, and here's one of the places where Jewish voices, such as those of Jules Isaac and Abraham Heschel, had a great impact. Nostra Aetate uh, 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 hi highlights another New Testament quote where the use of the present tense is key. Um, theirs is the sonship and the glory and the covenants and the law and the worship and the promises, uh, etc. This is from Paul's letter to the Romans chapter 9. So in co affirming co contemporary Judaism, and again, this is for its Catholic audience, of course, uh, these statements also communicate one of Nostra Aetate's boldest theological claims, that the covenant relationship between God and Israel is ongoing and intact even now. This asser assertion challenged the longstanding claim that the church had superseded or replaced the Jewish people as God's elect. The idea being that God only had one chosen people, and it was the church. This idea goes back at least to the second century, 
uh, of the common era, emerging out of the conflicts between uh, the, the uh, fledgling Christian groups uh, and uh, early rabbinic groups. Um, the second century Christian writer Justin Martyr is one of the first to argue that Christians were the true Israel. Um, and Christian authors argued that it was the failure of Jews to recognize Jesus as, as Messiah and their collusion in his death that led to the divine annulment of the first covenant, a view that scholars sometimes refer to as punitive supersessionism. It was this very idea, Jules Isaac had pointed out, that cultivated the vicious contempt for Jews that pervaded the Christian world, making a tragedy like the Holocaust possible. If God had rejected the Jews, he argued, why should Christians embrace them? Right? That was the, his, his questioning of that idea. So the idea of supersessionism was largely based on this charge of deicide. That is that the Jews bore a collective guilt for the death uh, of Jesus. Uh, the early Christian author Melito of Sardis um, in his work on the Pascha declared unequivocally that, quote, Israel killed God, end quote. And for centuries following, Christians hurled this slander at Jews, justifying unjust treatment, pogroms, and worse. And it also led to the famous accusations of blood libel in the Middle Ages and in the modern period. And even as recently as the 1930s, some Christian theologians were claiming that the guilt of deicide was like a twin to original sin that Jews were born with. The difference being that baptism could heal original sin, but not the guilt of deicide. So the relevant text of Nostra Aetate is this one. It reads, true, the Jewish authorities and those uh, who followed their lead pressed for the death of Christ. Still, what happened in his passion cannot be charged against all the Jews without distinction, then alive, nor against the Jews of today. Although the church is the new people of God, the Jews should not be presented as rejected or accursed by God, as if this followed from the Holy Scriptures. Now, some news reports about this presented uh, this as the church pardoning Jews for the death of Jesus. But as some theologians pointed out, particularly Father Edward Flannery, who happened to be from uh, Providence and who served as advisor to the U.S. bishops, um, he said that Nostra Aetate was saying that this charge was totally baseless to begin with. There was nothing to forgive. It was simply setting the record straight. Now, over the decades since Nostra Aetate, this charge of deicide has largely been erased from Catholic catechetical instruction, uh, liturgy, and preaching. And in fact, I often find that the current generation of Catholic uh, college students is largely unaware that Christians ever made this charge. And they're quite scandalized when they learn about it. The new approach to supersessionism, that other idea, however, is a bit more complicated, uh, and it's caused some theological confusion and something of an identity crisis in, in the Catholic Church. Um, supersessionism provided an easy answer. Jews in the Old Covenant were out and Christians in the New Covenant were in. But now to say that Jews continue to live in covenant relationship with God this has raised theological questions about the relationship between the covenants and the path to salvation. On top of this, the Catholic Church has stated in its most recent document on Jewish uh, uh, Christian relations that there is no institutional mission to convert Jews. And Pope Francis has been very vocal in rejecting proselytism directed at Jews. Even Emeritus Pope Benedict weighed in in 2018 following an exchange with Rabbi Ari Folger of Vienna. Uh, and Pope Benedict wrote, quote, to Israel, there was not and still is not a mission, but rather dialogue, end quote. So what does this say about traditional Christian doctrine about faith in Christ and baptism? These are ongoing and exciting theological discussions and a vibrant exchanges occur occurring on these questions between Christian and Jewish scholars. Is it Lemon? The most recent Vatican document, Gifts and Calling, which was issued in 2015, rejects what it calls a two paths to salvation solution, but it does suggest the following. It says, that the Jews are participants in God's salvation is theologically unquestionable, but how that can be possible without confessing Christ explicitly is and remains an unfathomable divine mystery, end quote. 
So the affirmation of the continuing relationship between God and Israel and the insistence on salvation through Christ has led to a real theological conundrum, but lots of theologians are happy to be grappling with it. The fourth point, over the centuries, Jesus was divorced from his Jewish origins. Uh, this has occurred through artistic portraits, which show him as a blonde haired, blue eyed European, uh, and through the characterization of his criticism of his contemporaries as the setup for a battle between Jews and Christians. So Nostra Aetate called upon Christians to rediscover the Jewishness of Jesus uh, and, his and his first followers. So one of the quotes I had up here earlier stated that from them, quote, from the Jews is the Christ according to the flesh the son of the Virgin Mary. So reminding Catholics of both uh, Jesus's and Mary's Jewishness. Uh, but this section also reminds Christians, quote, that the apostles, the church's mainstay and pillars, as well as most of the early disciples who proclaimed Christ's gospel to the world sprang from the Jewish people. Now, the fact that an official church document of such standing had to state such an obvious historical fact indicated that Christians had lost sight of something very crucial, the Jewishness of Jesus and the Jewishness at the core of Christianity. Even today in my own classes, if I ask students what religion Jesus practiced, more often than, more often than not, they'll respond by saying he was Catholic. Um, the separation of Jesus from his Jewishness began very early on uh, and has uh, continued uh, as Jesus is often defined over and against Jews and Judaism. Uh, and this is a point that's illustrated in the book, The Misunderstood Jew uh, by Amy, Amy, Jill, Amy Jill Levine. Uh, in fact, when grappling with and defining the doctrine of Jesus's humanity and divinity, the early church fathers argued about things like, was Jesus' body real? What was the nature of his soul? Did he suffer? Uh, and they even talked about his digestive system. Uh, but hardly is his Jewishness ever a part of the discussion except in an antagonistic way. And as Amy Jill Levine has demonstrated, as Christians came to shape understandings of what it meant to be Christian, the Jew came to represent everything opposite. Right? Uh, and these were often coupled with um, uh, quotes from the Bible, uh, where either the prophets uh, criticized the people of their time, or Jesus criticized um, people of his time, and these were sort of universalized. Uh, to exemplify um, the worst traits um, that Christians associated uh, with Judaism. So the result was an othering of Jews, and we might say even a severing of Jews from their own tradition. If Jesus was the ideal Jew, then his contemporaries, according to this line of thought, failed in their observance of their own religion if they did not do uh, as he did. So the call of Nostra Aetate to a renewed appreciation of the Jewishness of Jesus and his earliest followers, um, including St. Paul, had a twofold intent. First, to encourage Christians to explore and recognize those aspects of their own religious tradition that emerge from Judaism. And second, to promote a solidarity between Jews and Christians on the basis of uh, a common uh, heritage. <clears throat> Uh, and in many ways, this principle found its most fruitful expression in the field of biblical studies, uh, which in the mid and late 20th century revis revisited some of the traditional understandings of the Christian scriptures and gave more appreciation uh, to um, uh, the study of ancient Judaism. Pope Francis would later put it this way, saying, quote, inside every Christian is a Jew, um, end quote. We could debate about what that means exactly. Um, the fifth and final point, uh, in the aftermath of the Holocaust, and yet some 20 years after the liberation of the Nazi concentration camps, Nostra Aetate soundly and finally condemned anti-Semitism by name. Uh, and here's the text. Furthermore, in her rejection of every persecution against any man, the church, mindful of the patrimony she shares with the Jews and moved not by political reasons, but by the gospel's spiritual love, decries hatred, persecutions, displays of anti-Semitism directed against Jews at any time and by anyone, end quote. While the Nazi terror was over, anti-Semitism still persisted in the 1960s. And as we know from either personal experience or recent events, it's still alive and well today and seeing a troubling resurgence. 
Nostra Aetate makes, anti makes anti-Semitism anti-gospel. And later popes, particularly John Paul II uh, and Pope Francis, would explicitly call anti-Semitism a sin. Now at this point, I think it's also important to mention some of the pioneering women who contributed to the fruits of Nostra Aetate, and I'll point out two. Uh, sister Rose Thiering was a Dominican sister from uh, Wisconsin. Uh, she wrote her 1961 PhD dissertation on the presentation of Jews and Judaism in Catholic catechetical textbooks. Uh, and she brought to light the inaccuracies and the negative stereotypes that Catholic school students were exposed to and influenced by. Her work was brought to the attention of Cardinal Bea, the, Pope, uh, the cardinal who was in, in charge of the document, by way of the American Jewish, the American Jewish Committee's Judith Banke, who incorporated Thiering's findings into a memorandum she presented to Cardinal Bea uh, entitled, The Image of the Jew in Catholic Teaching. Uh, Thiering died in 2006, but Banke is still active and growing very strong in the field at the age of 93. Uh, in fact, we recently hosted her uh, at Providence College. So the impact and the road ahead. Uh, in the year 2000, the Catholic Church observed a Jubilee year. Uh, it was a special one because it came at the end of the 20th century and the end of the second Christian millennium. Uh, it was seen as the doorway into the third millennium and for the church, a journey forward with eyes carefully focused on what was behind. It was also extraordinary of, uh, because of what happened inside St. Peter's Basilica on March 12, 2000. That was called a day of pardon. Pope John Paul II publicly prayed for forgiveness for the errors that the sons and daughters of the church had committed against others throughout the first and second millennia. The Pope acknowledged the sins Catholics had committed against other Christians, against the dignity of women, against ethnic minorities and indigenous people, against basic human rights, and there was a specific prayer for pardon for sins against the people of Israel. And here are the words of that prayer. God of our fathers, you chose Abraham and his descendants to bring your name to the nations. We are deeply saddened by the behavior of those who in the course of history have caused these children of yours to suffer. And asking your forgiveness, we wish to commit ourselves to genuine brotherhood with the people of the covenant. Later that month, the Pope made his famous pilgrimage to Israel. And when he visited Jerusalem, he placed a piece of paper with the text of this prayer into the Western Wall and paused for some moments of prayer. John Paul himself was a catalyst for this gesture. Uh, as a man in wartime Poland, he personally experienced the oppression of the Nazi occupation and witnessed the atrocities committed against Jews, some of them close personal friends. He was also a master of images and was keenly aware of the meaning and impact of his public gestures. Now, the words are rather generic. They don't mention any particular actions or uh, atrocities, though without question, they implicitly acknowledge um, uh, the, the Christian involvement uh, in uh, pogroms and, and uh, especially Catholics who were involved during the Holocaust. Uh, and yet this prayer, these words spoken by a Pope would not have been thinkable before Nostra Aetate. So to close, I'd like to consider four themes on the impact of Nostra Aetate and the road ahead. So first, Nostra Aetate has taught Catholics how to appreciate and listen to Jewish voices. For centuries, Christians consumed and replicated caricatures of Jews and Judaism. Uh, and even those figures who shaped the ideas that would lead to Nostra Aetate, Osterreicher, Tima, Jacques Maritain, uh, did so initially, initially without the engagement uh, with Jews. Um, Jewish intellectuals were involved in the shaping of Nostra Aetate, in its implementation, uh, and even continued to act as consultants to subsequent statements. Uh, in fact, at the rollout of the most recent document in 2015, Two prominent Jewish figures, Rabbi David Rosen of the American Jewish Committee and Professor Edward Kessler of Cambridge were on the Vatican panel uh, alongside Cardinal, uh, Cardinal Kirk Koch. And that was, that was a first. Uh, second, much more needs to be done to make ordinary Christians and Jews aware of the teachings of Nostra Aetate. Now, although 2015 was the 50th anniversary of Nostra Aetate, 
After 50 years, the document is still not well known, particularly in the Catholic world. Whenever I mention the document in adult education classes, I conduct in either churches or synagogue settings, it's safe to say that the majority of adults, the Catholics as well as the Jews, has, had never, have never heard of it. Now, the dilemma here is that on this issue, the church is, uh, the church at the institutional level is far ahead of its flock. This doesn't happen too often, uh, but this is a case where it's true. Um, the revolutionary teachings of Nostra Aetate and subsequent related documents are not trickling down to the pews. It's not a, pro a, pro a prominent part of seminary training. Uh, bishops, priests, and deacons responsible for preaching just have other priorities to address. So this poses a further challenge. Uh, as both the Holocaust and Vatican II fade out of living memory, there is danger that this renewed reflection could be lost. The third, Nostra Aetate has opened uh, the door to collaboration between Jews and Catholics on social issues, as well as open and frank dialogues. One of the first fruits to come from Nostra Aetate in the decades uh, immediately after its publication uh, was the collaboration between Jews and Christians on social issues ranging from civil rights to the fight against poverty uh, and other ways of advocating for social justice at national and local levels. In these early years, um, there was an understandable uncertainty among Jews about the intentions of the Catholic Church. Was this really going to change Catholic thinking or was this simply a new tactic to convert? So because of this, some leaders in the Jewish community maintained that interreligious dialogue was just not an option for Jews. Uh, Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik was prominent among the Orthodox Jewish voices on this question. Religious relativism and proselytism just loomed too large for Soloveitchik. Collaboration and activism on shared values were fine, but he gave a resounding no to theological dialogue. And this stood in contrast to the approach of Abraham Joshua Heschel. In the intervening decades, a level of trust and friendship has built up among leaders in the Jewish and Catholic communities that have made theological dialogue a more comfortable project, though still not prevalent. Among American Orthodox Jews, Rabbi Irving Greenberg has been a prominent figure here, and Professor Amy Jill Levine, a Jewish professor of ancient Judaism and early Christian studies, has also produced a number of scholarly and popular works aimed at encouraging historical and theological engagement among Jews and Christians. And lastly, in some parts of the Jewish world, Nostra Aetate has elicited a reciprocal response. Um, there have been a number of Jewish responses to Nostra Aetate. Uh, the first came in 2000 in the form of a full page advertisement in the New York Times. The statement called Dabru Emet, Hebrew for Speak Truth, uh, was signed by over 200 Jewish scholars and rabbis from the varying denominations of contemporary Judaism. The document presented eight theses, including Jews and Christians worship the same God and the humanly irreconcilable, dif irreconcil irreconcilable difference between Jews and Christians will not be settled until God redeems the entire world as promised in scripture. The document was met with some strong criticism in Jewish circles for its emphasis on commonalities and its diplomatic approach to long-standing differences. Nonetheless, Dabru Amet was significant, and this year marks its 20th anniversary. Uh, if you're interested in reading more on the reception of Dabru Amet, the Institute for Islamic Christian Jewish Studies is currently publishing a number of online essays looking back on Dabru Amet. And this is the, uh, the website. Now, a truly remarkable statement was issued in 2015 by an international group of Orthodox rabbis and scholars uh, called To Do the Will of Our Father in Heaven. That was the title. Uh, this document was a direct response to Nostra Aetate and the subsequent advances in Jewish Christian relations that had taken shape in the 50 years since the first publication of the document. What struck so many about this document was, it, was its move in a theological direction. Uh, for example, uh, the document states, quote, that the emergence of Christianity in human history is neither an accident nor an error, but the willed divine outcome and gift to the nations. Uh, the document provides a vision of Christians and Jews as what it calls partners in covenant with God, 
each having, quote, a common covenantal mission to perfect the world under the sovereignty of the Almighty, end quote. Okay, so to conclude, on the 50th anniversary of Nostra Aetate, Pope Francis said in his public audience, quote, since Nostra Aetate, indifference and opposition have turned into cooperation and goodwill. Enemies and strangers have uh, uh, became friends and brothers, end quote. The relationship between Jews and Christians has indeed changed in dramatic ways since the Holocaust, and especially in the 50 years since Vatican II. This transformation can be credited to courageous Jews and Catholics, individuals who challenged an, an institution to examine itself, its history, its self-understanding, and its understanding of the other, so that this self-examination would bring about fundamental change. But a 50-year commemoration is not the end of something, but the beginning. A document cannot make change, it can only chart out a way. Anti-Semitism, genocide, and hatred have not disappeared. The persecution of religious minorities is all too real. For example, the Yazidi in Iraq or Coptic Christians in Egypt, anti-immigrant nationalism in Europe and here at home, and of course, America's original sin of racism. As Jews and Catholics cross the threshold uh, into the next 50 years, we will face these challenges together, not separately. Education, dialogue, and self-examination can change not only individuals, but institutions. Thank you. Um, I think, um, <clears throat> thank you so much. There's a lot uh, that you uh, raised, Dr. Urbano, and uh, hopefully we can have a discussion. Um, anybody yeah. who wants to bring, bring up anything, please um, either speak up or put it in the chat whatever you feel more, uh, whatever's more convenient for you. I'd like to say something, if I may. My name is Gilbert Mendelson. I'm out in California. Hey, and Gil. Hi, hi, Doc, hi Dr. Weisberg. Uh, I'm very, um, um, I've read a bit about our relationship between Catholics and Jews, and I'm encouraged greatly by your, your talk, uh, but I am also sad I'm encouraged because it's a step in the right direction, the correct direction. I'm sad because it took so long. We had 2,000 years prior of uh, unimaginable, well, to me, uh, pain and suffering. But I think you, the key, if from my perspective, is educating the flock. They are still behind the clergy. I, I see it every day in my business career. I mean, I did. I'm retired now, but I've seen it uh, every day in my business career. We were all, we were on the fringe of being the others. Even in my, I'm 82 years old, so I've seen a few things growing up in America, first generation. That's my comment. But I am, I'm extremely encouraged, and I want to thank you so much for your your education and your, 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 your sharing your, the church's experience and, and uh, everything. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, Gilbert. Thank you, thank you for those, those comments. You know, there's, uh, when I was coming home from that conference in 2007, I was sitting on the plane next to um, a woman and we, you know, struck up a conversation. And what were you doing in Italy? What were you doing in Italy? And I said, oh, I was at a conference, uh, uh, you know, on Jewish Christian dialogue. And, and, and she said, well, I'm Catholic. She said, it's about time they start doing something like this. How long have they been doing this? And I said, well, about a half century. And she, and she was just sort of flabbergasted. She had no idea that this, that this had been going on. So, so it really is a problem of, even, even though there's been changes made to the way that, that Catholics are educated about Jews, in some ways it's not made explicit enough um, that this change has occurred. Um, and I think also one of the other problems, I didn't, didn't mention, there's just too much to talk about, um, but, but one other thing that we're facing now is that there's a, there are movements within the Catholic Church um, of clergy, um, some bishops, uh, which are either indifferent, antagonistic, or in some ways uh, oppositional to the whole Vatican Council in general. 
Um, so it's not an overwhelming part of the Catholic Church, but it's a very vocal part of the Catholic Church. And so that's a, another sort of in-house uh, challenge uh, that we face as we try to promote uh, the teachings of the council. Other uh, points people want to make or questions? Uh, I have a question. Dallas, Dallas, go ahead. Um, Dr. Arthur Urbano, I was just wondering, um, I, under I understand the importance of the Nostra Aetate document. I was just wondering that if it was something that you decided to pursue upon educating people on based on any past experiences or if this was just something that you sort of fell into as you got intrigued about it? No, that, that, that's, a great, that's a great question. Um, so a, a couple of things are instrumental. I think, you know, first of all was being invited to this conference on Jewish Christian relations by a local rabbi and, and kind of being introduced uh, to the world of, of Jewish Christian dialogue in a way that I hadn't been familiar with before was, was very inspirational. Um, and, you know, over the years since then, I mean, it hasn't been that many years, uh, uh, you know, 13 years or so, I, you know, I've started to reflect on, um, uh, you know, growing up and, and, you know, people have often asked, you know, well, you know, was there anything when you were a kid that might have influenced this? And as I think back on it, my, my mother was a, um, uh, she's a retired hairdresser. Um, and she worked in, um, it was a nursing home that was connected also to kind of a large apartment building in downtown Providence. And she always had a lot of Jewish clients. And she would always come home and tell me, oh, I had this conversation with one of my Jewish customers. We were talking about Passover and Easter. Uh, or, you know, sometimes some of her uh, Jewish customers uh, uh, knew that I went to Catholic school and that I liked religion. Uh, so when I was a kid, they would, they would send home boxes of matzah for me uh, with her. Uh, so there was always kind of this relationship uh, in, in a certain way um, with, uh, with, with, with people, Jewish people in the, in the Providence uh, community and, and via my mother's kind of attitude of, of interest and openness and, and dialogue that I think, you know, in retrospect, kind of opened the way uh, for, for, for me to be interested in it as well. So, so that was also a big um, um, uh, influence. I also had a Jewish uncle too, and I had a lot of interesting conversations with him as well. So, and that's the thing too, th these very personal connections are also something that's very important in the field of Jewish Christian dialogue, right? People will always say, it's not enough to talk about the ideas, right? The ideas are important, but we also have to form relationships and friendships with one another because that's the only way that this can really um, take root. So I, 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 I put a lot of stock in that, yeah. Yeah, thanks for that question, Dallas. Thank you for answering. Other uh, questions or comments? Alan? Uh, Dr. Urbano, I'd like to ask what the current status, I know you said that they're, they're not a large group, but it seems to me that the, the Pius X Society and the traditionalist, traditionalist Catholics um, are increasing uh, in influence and are criticizing uh, Pope Francis and uh, um, and anti-Judaism, if not anti-Semitism, uh, has been a strong, strong part. And what is what what is your view of their status and what the Church is trying to do to? Um, uh, to debate this. Yeah, that's 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 a great question and an important one. I mean, in a lot of ways, there's a lot of poisoning of the well going on, so to speak, um, around Vatican II in general, um, but also it's specifically on Nostra Aetate and uh, interreligious dialogue in general. Um, now, on the other hand, you know, Pope Francis has been making sort of extra efforts to sort of codify the importance of this and um, to point out the, um, 
you know, continuity is very important in, in Catholicism and to traditionalists too, right? So if something's new, it's bad, but if you, but if you can show that there's a tradition uh, and a continuity, so, you know, the, the continuity with all of the popes, you know, before him going back to the council um, to show that, you know, he's not pulling this out of a hat, but he's sort of continuing even the, you know, the things that Pope Benedict, who's, who's often a kind of a favorite of the traditionalists, he was totally on board with Nostra Aetate uh, and even had some say in its uh, drafting. Um, and he himself actively promoted it uh, while he was uh, Pope. Uh, not perfectly, um, but he did. So, you know, I think one of the, one of the problems here is really is social media. Uh, you know, not to blame social media for, for, for everything, but these loud, the loudest voices um, uh, against the council, against this document in, in, in particular, you know, have found a way to, to kind of constantly, constantly sort of, in some cases, take, take advantage of people's ignorance, right? That, that people don't really know about this. So before they learn about it, let's just, you know, sort of cast it in a bad light. Um, as something that's anti-Catholic or against the Catholic tradition. So a lot of work has to be done in seminary training, uh, as I said before, um, in training priests and future bishops uh, to understand this document and um, how to implement it responsibly, responsibly and, and generously um, in a way that's entirely um, consistent with, with Catholic teaching, um, because it is Catholic teaching. Um, yeah, so I mean, even, I'm thinking, you know, a couple of weeks ago, Pope Francis went to Iraq um, and he, you know, part of one of his um, events was an interreligious service um, in Ur, uh, the, the sort of scriptural home of Abraham. Um, and, you know, even before he set foot on the plane, right, all, all, on social media, all of the well poisoners were already saying, oh, you know, he's, he's a relativist, you know, he's, he's kumbaya, you know, so they, they, they take advantage of these situations to just kind of obscure what's actually going on. And that's really hard. That's really hard to fight, unfortunately. Um, but I think education uh, really is, uh, is really is key. Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks for that question. It's not only education, it's also the relationships that we build, you know, relationships to God, uh, relationships to other people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because when you have a relationship with someone, um, you know, the, the way you would respond to their difference from you is 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 different than, than when you don't have a real relationship with people who belong to a different group or a different religion or, or, or what have you. You know, it's too easy to caricature and, uh, and to denigrate, you know. Other, uh, other points? Uh, you mentioned, uh, again, education is um, in places like Providence College, is that, being featured in in a big way, which uh, to be personal, I mean, what your role? Obviously, you're doing. You know, you're an important person in this kind of dialogue. Do you have an effect on the curriculum in uh, at PC, for example? Yeah, to a to a certain uh, to a certain degree, I have an influence. So so um, when we we began this um, lecture series uh, in 2009. Um, Part of the thinking was, you know, we can develop a new class um, and have, you know, make that available to students. Um, but, you know, on a semester basis or even a yearly basis, you know, that might reach 20, 40 students, which is important and, and significant. If, so we decided to start with a lecture series because this way, this is something that was open to the whole college. Um, and, you know, we would turn out, you know, to, you know, twice, twice a year, you know, a group of 100, 150 people. Um, and so, so the lecture series has really taken root as sort of part of the regular calendar of college events. So people expect it. Um, we have, you know, regular attendance from faculty and administration, um, and even the local community. We have a huge turnout from the, the Providence uh, Jewish community, which is very supportive of the program. 
um, I was telling you earlier, uh, a, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of our alumni are Jewish um, and attended, you know, PC in the 50s and the 60s. And so I've met a lot of these people uh, over the course of the years and have learned a lot about their interreligious experience at being at Providence College, um, you know, back then. Um, but since then, we've, we've also, um, I have introduced a new course. I have a course on um, Jewish-Christian uh, relations over the centuries. Um, all of our students have to take, uh, 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 it's called the Development of Western Civilization. And I've been encouraging um, people teaching in that program to um, uh, integrate more about Judaism and more Jewish authors uh, even rabbinic Judaism, I do a whole section with with my class on 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 the Talmud uh, in in that uh, in that class, um, and students, you know, students respond very positive uh, positively to it. They're they're really interested uh, in that uh, material, because otherwise, the traditional way of teaching that program, you know, Jews were introduced as you know, there's the Old Testament, then the background to Christianity, and then the Holocaust, you know, and and you know, all those things are important to mention. And to be part of the story, but it gives a skewed uh, image of, of Jewish history and leave, you know, leaves out the contributions um, that uh, Jews have made over the centuries. So I've been trying to encourage my colleagues to, um, to incorporate uh, more of that um, material. And there's, there's been a general move over the past several years uh, to integrate uh, more diverse uh, material in that, in that class anyway. So I'm, I'm hoping uh, we'll see some of that. Yeah. yeah, it's a good point. You know, when I, I've talked sometimes in classes that, uh, or people, that people for, don't realize, I mean, non-Jews, even sometimes Jews, that there was a split off, you know, it was a, it was a uh, destruction of the temple. Judaism uh, morphed into rabbinic Judaism and went forward while Christianity went in its own way. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, so Jews are not, I mean, Jews don't sacrifice bulls you know, or sheep now, they, you know, yeah. they worship in a different way, but m many Christians, if they have any knowledge of the, let's say the Old Testament may think that that's what we'd be, that's what we're doing. Yeah. You know, yeah. Well, silly. you know, yeah. One, at one point, this was, this was before we started all of this. I um, uh, mentioned to uh, a, a colleague who no, no longer, who's since retired from the, uh, from the college, you know, I, I said, you know, we don't really have any courses on, on Judaism. And very seriously, he, he responded to me saying, well, we have a course on the Old Testament. And I said, well, that's not really Judaism. That's not Judaism. That's, that's the Old Testament. That's different. Um, so, yeah, um, it, it's interesting, uh, the, the kind of perspective. You know, you mentioned that, you know, the, the both rabbinic Judaism and Christianity emerging from Second Temple Judaism. And, and this is why, um, you know, the, the, the Catholic sort of reframing of all of this has, has thought in terms of siblings, uh, as sort of sibling religions. Um, um, now, w when John Paul II uh, said, you are our elder brothers, he meant that in an entirely genuine and sincere way. Um, but if he had had um, uh, sort of, you know, it might have helped him to have a, uh, a, a Jewish consultant on that because it was later pointed out that elder brothers don't always make out so well uh, in, in the Hebrew Bible. So maybe that wasn't, you know, the best, the best way to put it because it carries a lot of baggage with it. Uh, right, but certainly it's not what he meant. Uh, uh, he, you know, he sort of meant it in a, in a sincere way. Uh, but still, um, you know, we've got to be careful with, with, uh, with the language and the images uh, that we use. Yeah, there's no question. I mean, a lot of this is impressionistic. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get into the details, which are important if you're really true, you know, in terms of really in-depth education. But for a lot of people, it's more impressionistic. And somehow we have to frame it in a way that can, people can understand. Uh, and more of that has to be done, maybe has to be done in the, in the church, not just in the Catholic church, in the Protestant churches, and, mm -hmm. and even in the, in the synagogues to try to mm -hmm. understand each other. Uh, mm -hmm. better but mm -hmm. and i hope we're not regressing in some ways you know we're we're sort of in yeah. an interesting period at this time yeah i mean there's kind of a i mean when i think about where we are now there's kind of 
the current is sort of moving ahead and moving back simultaneously, you know, in, in, in different ways. And so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping and praying and confident that the, the forward moving um, current uh, will, uh, will win out. Uh, because, you know, this isn't something new anymore in the Catholic Church, right? I mean, we're past 50 years now. And I mean, Catholic history, 50 years isn't a long time. Um, uh, but, you know, this has taken hold in a lot of important ways and uh, has really shaped important and a lot of segments of, of the Catholic Church. So I, I think it would be it would be hard to to, to move backwards entirely. And I, I certainly hope we don't. Yeah. Well, as you mentioned, and I remember I went to a conference at uh, Seton Hill University at the 50th mm -hmm. anniversary. On the, that's when I first found out about the South Trail. Oh, okay. And they were and they were saying the same thing you did. It wasn't filtering down to you know uh, to the uh, parishes in a way mm -hmm. that it should have. Even back to, that was what, five years ago now. I hope more yeah. of that can be done. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, that's something I've run into when I when I teach classes. You know, I remember one of the first classes I, I taught on this at my parish. Um, I had somebody come up to me afterwards, at, you know, just kind of concerns like, oh, this sound, you know, should we be moving in this new direction? This, you know, I said, this isn't new. This is, you know, this, the church has been doing this for 50 years and the popes have been thoroughly involved in promoting this. So, you know, there's a lot of misunderstanding and, you um, uh, just people don't have a lot of uh, opportunity to hear about it. Uh, it's not often um, incorporated into sermons. I mean, sermons are getting shorter and shorter, so so there's 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 uh, it's getting harder to put more in there. But you know, we're coming up on Holy Week and and Good Friday, and you know, uh, in the Catholic Church, we read the Gospel of John's version of uh, the Passion of Jesus, his trial and crucifixion. Um, and that's one of the most difficult ones to right. hear because it's the Jews, the Jews, the Jews. And, um, you know, I've yet to hear a good sermon that addresses that specifically on Good Friday. Um, I, I, unfortunately, I don't hear them. And that's when they need to be said. You know? Yeah. That, you know, as you know, traditionally, that's been a really difficult time for Jews around yeah. Easter. <laughs> That, mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the more dangerous times, you know, I mean, historically, because of people getting roused up, you know, hearing those sermons and, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, any other, uh, again, this is, uh, I'd like to do more of this. I think we have, a, it's, a, uh, it's an important discussion, but thank you for bringing this to us, Dr. Bono. Um, <clears throat> so for some one reason, I guess uh, Gary and I will figure that out. A number of people weren't able to get in. Um, I think Gary, you said there was uh, an email problem. Was it Eventbrite? Yeah, when I sent out uh, uh, an email to, well, I sent out a message uh, to Eventbrite. You know, they said they were having problems with emails. So, um, I, you know, I don't understand unless you know. I mean, we had thirty people at one time, so. You know, so we've got half of the people. I don't know yeah. what happened to the other half. So uh, well, I know a few people that I've gotten emails couldn't get in. Yeah, maybe then, or, or maybe they gave. That was it. I had two people that couldn't get in. Right, but and I um, them everything that I had, and they still couldn't get in. I don't. So that's why I'm thinking it's on their end, not on. Uh, right, lots of. But anyway, we recorded this, and so one of the good things about all our programs are are now going to be on our website. So. Uh, it will be available for folks, <laughs> and we, yeah. we'll, we'll we'll let people know too who might want to have might have wanted to have joined us. But um, and again, thank you so.